All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center's Tuesday afternoon Facebook Live. My name is Pete Mealy. I am executive director here at Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, and we are coming to you each and every Tuesday, bringing you stories of religion, medicine, war, and peace here from Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. Uh, if you like this, uh, if you like seeing videos like this, we ask that you please like them, please share them with your friends, let your friends know about the amazing content that you're seeing uh, from up here on Seminary Ridge. And if you really like what you're seeing, please consider donating, uh, becoming a member of Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It's through the generosity of folks like you that we are allowed, that we are able to keep doing exciting videos like this and providing the great content that we do from up here on the ridge. Uh, we're going to take you back to July of 1862, a year before the Battle of Gettysburg takes place. And if you are Abraham Lincoln sitting in Washington, D.C. during this time, you are having a very big problem. And it's during the months of July and August of 1862 that Abraham Lincoln is going to put out a call for 300,000 new volunteers to join the Union Army to help put down the rebellion of the Confederacy. And it's through this call for 300,000 new troops that two men's lives are going to be forever changed and are eventually going to intersect up here on Seminary Ridge. And these two men are Jeremiah Hoffman and Andrew Greg Tucker, both of the 142nd Pennsylvania Volunteers, a regiment that is raised as in, call, in this call for 300,000 new volunteers. Both men, Hoffman and Tucker, have just graduated from college. Both of them graduate in late July. Hoffman from Franklin and Marshall College out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Tucker from the University of Lewisburg in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, today called Bucknell University. Both men graduate from college and then immediately enlist, joining the ranks of the Army of, of the Union Army, the 142nd Pennsylvania. And both of these men are going to serve on guard duty around Washington, D.C. with the 142nd and eventually join the Army of the Potomac, the main Union Army fighting in the Eastern Theater right before the Battle of Fredericksburg. And these are going to be the men that are with Meade breaking through the Confederate lines at Fredericksburg. They're going to lose about 250 men in the 142nd during this assault. They're not going to see much fighting in Chancellorsville, but they are really going to get their glory out on McPherson Ridge behind me, about 640 yards behind me uh, on the morning of July 1st, 1863. The men of the 142nd are with Biddle's Brigade, Thomas Rowley's old brigade, now that Rowley has moved up to Division Command, as Abner Doubleday has moved up to Corps Command. Um, uh, Biddle is going to take command of the brigade, making up, made up of the 121st Pennsylvania, the 142nd Pennsylvania, the 80th New York, and the 151st Pennsylvania that we talked about last week. They are going to come across Saks Bridge on the morning of July 1st, 1863, travel up along the west bank of Willoughby Run, and arrive on McPherson Ridge sometime after the initial fighting has taken place uh, between the Iron Brigade and Archer's Brigade and Herbst Woods and Cutler's Brigade and Joe Davis's Brigade north of the Pike. So they get here during that sort of afternoon lull. And the 142nd is going to be on the right of the brigade line, but behind and and to the left uh, and to the left of the Iron Brigade, which is still positioned in Herbst Woods. At about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the Confederate attack uh, begins again, and suddenly the First Corps is being pushed off of McPherson Ridge, and it is this time that we're going to pick up the story of Hoffman and Tucker. As, J as Johnston Pettigrew's North Carolinians are working to push that First Corps line off of McPherson Ridge, Jeremiah Hoffman, lieutenant, is shot through the right hip, goes through his pelvis, and lodges near his spine. At about the same time, he looks up and Lieutenant Hoffman, Lieutenant Tucker, is right there on a horse. 
Tucker is wounded in the arm. The horse is wounded. Tucker jumps off, picks Hoffman up, throws Hoffman over the back of his horse, and sends Hoffman back here to the Lutheran Seminary, being used as a hospital, being used as a hospital since that the, the, the fighting started early that morning. And Jeremiah Hoffman, if Rob, if you could follow me right here, Jeremiah Hoffman is going to, to end up here on the first floor of the seminary hospital in the in the, the living quarters of Lydia and Ema uh, Mary and Emmanuel Ziegler, the steward and the matron of the seminary right here. If you've been in Seminary Ridge Museum, it is where the restrooms are today. But this end of the building, the southern end of the building, was the living quarters of the Ziegler family. And this is where Jeremiah Hoffman, on the other side of the building, is going to to lie on this side is going to be the colonel of the 142nd, Robert Cummins, who is grievously wounded on July 1st in the southwest corner of the building. Hoffman is going gonna, is gonna to write extensively about his experiences here in the seminary hospital. He writes that they had no, the doctors had no tools, no way to give care to the wounded soldiers that are in this building. The Confederate soldiers come in, the Confederate doctors come in, take all of the supplies for themselves and leave the, the men of the Union Army here to sort of fend for themselves until the building is retaken on July 5th. By the morning of July 2nd, in the fields here through what's now Valentine Hall, an artillery battery from the 3rd Richmond Howitzer sets up in these fields right on the southern corner, the southeastern corner of the building, firing towards Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge, which you would be able to see if this building weren't here. Counter battery fire, the Union Army firing back at this battery is hitting this building, hitting the Lutheran Seminary building full of wounded soldiers. Jeremiah Hoffman recognizes that something needs to be done and he finds a soldier who is lightly wounded and tells him to take the generous pe red petticoat belonging to Mary Ziegler, the matron here of the seminary, the generous red petticoat that's hanging over a lounge in Mary's bedroom, rip some pieces off of it and this, the lightly wounded soldier goes up to the cupola of this building and ties those pieces of red flannel petticoat to the cupola to indicate to the Union batteries on Cemetery Hill that this is a field hospital, that it should not be shelled. doesn't do much work because we know that for days after, the building is still being shelled. In fact, Jeremiah Hoffman writes about a shell bursting under the entry door, this entry here on the south southern end of the building. The rooms, the, the, the hallway fills with smoke and flame, and people think that the building is burning down. And men are trying to get out of this building, trying to get down to the basement to escape the building that they think is burning. Hoffman writes about another really unfortunate experience in this building, as there's a man on the upper floors on the, second or, on the first or second night who's calling out for water. And they hear this shuffle and bang and shuffle and bang as this man is crawling down the stairs looking for water, crying out for water. And every time he cries out, his voice gets more and more hollow and, whisk and turns into a whisper. And by the morning, they find the man dead at the bottom of the stairs. But probably Hoffman's most vivid experience comes on July 4th. Because this is the day that he discovers that Andrew Greg Tucker has died. And he writes that the last time that he saw Tucker was, that when, was when Tucker was saving his life. When Tucker was throwing Hoffman on his horse and sending him back here to the seminary. In the retreat from McPherson's Ridge, Tucker was wounded two more times. The last wound into his back, fatal goes through his bowels. Tucker is brought into this building and ends up on one of the upper floors. And on the morning of the 4th, he passes away and is buried in the garden. Rob, let's walk a little bit more. Buried in the garden in front of the seminary, somewhere in this vicinity, but close enough to the window that Hoffman can watch the burial take place. And I'm going to read Hoffman's quote. Watching this burial take place. Supposedly. 
Well, we've seemed to lost Wi-Fi, but he, he talks about watching them lower uh, Tucker's body into a grave lined with fence posts. And as he's watching this, Tucker's head falls out of the blanket that he's being carried in, and his jet black hair is dragged along the ground. And it would not be called unmanly, Hoffman writes, that a few tears shed down his face. They brought Tucker's body downstairs in a blanket. They roughly lined his grave with fence pilings and buried him besides Colonel Cummins. I was then lying on the bunk and lifting my head, I could see into the garden. They were holding the body over the grave when the head slipped over the edge of the blanket and the lieutenant's beautiful jet black hair dragged over the ground. The thought of his mother and sisters was called up and surely it cannot be called unmanly that a few tears stole down my cheeks. Less than two months earlier, on May 22nd, Andrew Greg Tucker had penned a series of resolutions for his hometown newspaper in Lewisburg, signed by the entire company. And in it, Tucker and his comrades signed, saying, we are endeavoring to do our duty by serving in the Army of the Union and shall not shirk from dangers and death in defense of our principles. But as Tucker is dying, his thoughts turn to his country, his thoughts turn to his mother, widowed mother, and his sisters. One of the last things he says to the surgeon is, I am a very young man, but I am willing to die for my country. I wish, would like to see my mothers and sisters, my mother and sister, sisters, but never will. Jeremiah Hoffman leaves this building on July 13th taken to a field hospital in a larger city. Tucker's body remains here until his mother, the president, and the president of the University of Lewisburg and another professor travel here to Gettysburg to reclaim his body. And today, T Tucker and his family rest on a hillside in Lewisburg overlooking Bucknell University. It's a very beautiful spot. Uh, that I had the pleasure to visit just a few months back. We have a post about it on our Facebook page. So Jeremiah Hoffman and Andrew Greg Tucker, two lives that intersected here on Seminary Ridge in the building in the Lutheran Seminary, just one of hundreds of stories that we could tell that occur here up on this ridge and in this building uh, and tell the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. My name is Pete Mealy, Executive Director of Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center coming to you here from Seminary Ridge on our Tuesday afternoon Facebook Live. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, please share it with your friends, let them know of the content that you're seeing, and also please consider joining as a member, donating to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. Again, it's through the generosity of people like you that we can continue telling these stories, like the story of Hoffman and Tucker McFarland last week. And we hope to see you up on the ridge soon.